There have been three screen adaptations of All Quiet on the Western Front, Eric Maria Remarque's 1928 novel of one soldier's experience of the Great War. The first, released in 1930 and directed by Lewis Milestone, was a sensation. It won two Academy Awards, for Outstanding Production and Best Director, and wide praise from critics and moviegoers at the time. It remains one of the most acclaimed films of the era, routinely making lists of the greatest films of all time. The second, released in 1979, was a made-for-TV movie starring Richard Thomas and Ernest Borgnine. It won an Emmy and a Golden Globe but, like a lot of TV movies from the 1970s and 80s, is largely forgotten. The third adaptation of Remarque's novel was released this year by Netflix. Directed by Edward Berger, a German-born director and screenwriter, it is a primarily German production that has received some praise for its harrowing recreations of trench warfare. And it is, indeed, a brutal and visually impressive depiction of the mind-numbing violence and chaos of the First World War. I watched both the 1930 and the 2022 films this week. Not out of any particular project, but because I was interested to see the latter, and once I had done so, decided I would watch the first adaptation as well, to compare and contrast. I also skimmed through the book, which I last read in college, but which I still remember well. I should say, here, that I don't think the new film works. Every filmmaker who adapts a work from another medium for the screen has to make a set of decisions about what to include and what to exclude, what to emphasize and what to ignore, what to actually adapt and what to leave on the page. A good adaptation is not one that shows total fealty to the original source material a good adaptation, instead, is one that chooses and changes with an eye toward the essence of that material Lucino Visconti's 1963 adaptation of The Leopard by the Italian writer Giuseppe Tomasi di Lampedusa is not faithful to every beat of the 1958 novel. But it captures its essence, the story of a changing society and those soon to be left behind as relics of a dead world. The 1930 adaptation of All Quiet on the Western Front also captures the essence of the novel. Not just its anti-war message, but also its interest in the profound alienation of war, the terrible toll it takes on those enlisted to fight it and the very real sense that even soldiers who survive can never really come home. Remark is not as interested in the war as geopolitics as he is in the war as human absurdity made manifest. Our cast of characters in the book isn't particularly decent or virtuous or strong or smart, some of them are simply lucky, until they aren't. The 1930 film captures this perfectly. Our protagonist, Paul Balmer, is just another boy, caught up in the patriotic fervor of 1914 along with his classmates. They enlist together and believe, all through basic training, that they are about to embark on an adventure. It is only when they see the war with their own eyes, and experience their first taste of combat, that the scales fall. There is levity, yes, and there is camaraderie, but more often there is misery and fear and the constant presence of death. After three years in the trenches, the boys, or at least those who have survived, are permanently scarred, alienated from themselves as well as those around them. When Paul returns home after an injury, he attempts to relate to former teachers and other adults who experienced the war from a distance, and he finds he doesn't belly. It leads to this remarkable monologue, given as he tries to explain to another crop of young men, eager to fight, that war is folly. The 